Hi everyone, I'm Joe's Mary on behalf of GenScript, and today we are interviewing Dr. Benjamin Tenoever. So Dr. Tenoever, can you tell us more about your latest work investigating uh, variant independent protection conferred by immune memory from SARS-CoV-2? Absolutely, thanks for having me, uh, Rosemary, uh, Joe's, Joe's Mary, right? Um, uh, yeah, so I, um, I am uh, I'm a virologist and I have been studying how viruses interact with their host for uh, 20 years now. Uh, I'm at New York University, and obviously in the uh, response to the pandemic, our program completely adapted to the study of SARS-CoV-2. Um, we initially started off by just studying how it behaved in human lung cells, in, in, you know, in cell culture dishes, and then advanced to small animal models. Uh, and for SARS-CoV-2, Really, the gold standard model happened to be the golden hamster, um, not because we chose the golden hamster, but because um, if you wanted to use mice, which is the normal standard, um, for reasons that are purely st uh, stochastic, really, the original Wuhan strain of SARS-CoV-2 was not uh, well adapted to engage the receptor uh, that is expressed in mice. And so you either had to adapt the virus to be able to grow in mice, which isn't great, or you had to adapt the mice to be able to susceptible to the virus, which also isn't great. Whereas hamsters, you can just take the virus straight out of nature, administer it in the same way that you know you and I would uh, be uh, exposed to the virus, and they develop very similar symptoms. They don't they don't die. They don't really develop COVID nineteen, but they do develop much of the signs leading up to it. So they get um, it's called ground glass opacity, so their lungs get full of fluid. Um, they experience um, systemic inflammation. Um, they, they clearly have respiratory distress for about four or five days. We see the same kind of infiltration happening in their lungs that we see in human COVID-19 cases. And so it really has been uh, just an excellent model for um, understanding the biology of COVID. And, and to your question, understanding how you know, your immune response to one variant crosses over to your immune response to the other variants. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. And, you know, one of the things that has made it difficult, uh, or at least more challenging, is that the hamster model is much less used than, say, the mouse model. And so for that reason, there are very few reagents, or at least quality good reagents, that you can count on to look at T cells, to look at B cells, um, and to be able to, you know, study the immune response in this way. Um, and so, we have done our best to address that, and actually, with the help of GenScript, uh, we have been able to monitor, you know, when you get, uh, you know, the original Wuhan strain, for example, how your B cells react, how your T cells react, what kind of antibodies you make, and then, you know, on top of that, we have the ability to um, take the blood of a hamster and either deplete out the B cells or deplete out the T cells, and you put the uh, non-depleted cells back into a, a naive recipient animal. And then you can then challenge that animal and say how much of your immune response and your protection is mediated by, say, just B cells or just T cells or the combination of the two. And you can do that to the same strain that you have originally challenged with, or you can now add variants to it. And this is really our platform to understand the biology between virus and host. And so using this uh, golden hamster model to explore um, and how immune memory is built from SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, what, how do you think the new variant Omicron will affect us, affect us in the battle against COVID-19? Uh, your article mentioned that with aggressive vaccination campaigns, um, we can resolve the pandemic. So uh, how do you think the new variant might affect our current battle and the research we know so far? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and you know there are a lot of questions about uh, Omicron or Omicron or however you say it um, that are still unknown, largely because the virus has not really been distributed to the community yet. So there are lots of experiments that the community is ready to perform to be able to answer those questions, but without the virus, it's very difficult. Um, the sequence of the new spike is readily available, but even that to synthesize it and make it into a tool to study these same questions also takes weeks to do. Uh, and so we're going to be in a holding pattern for a little while before you can answer that question with you know, complete confidence. Uh, but what you can say um, is actually that, that Omicron doesn't actually seem to be deserving of the panic it's causing. Um, from a scientific point, it's very interesting, and I'm happy to talk to you about that. But from, you know, uh, from a standpoint of it escaping 
you know, all the vaccinated individuals and, you know, basically causing another another all new pandemic with all new shutdowns. I don't think that's going to happen. It doesn't appear like um, Omicron is so much different in its immune uh, constellation than Delta is, for example. And, and to, to that point, um, you know, individuals that are vaccinated that get exposed to Omicron can maintain some replication in the upper respiratory tract. They can transmit the virus, but that is also true for Delta. But those individuals that have been documented as Omicron positive cases have generally been either totally asymptomatic or just shown very mild symptoms. So it is not increasing in pathogenicity, it's increasing maybe in transmissibility. But even in, in that case, it's not even clear that Omicron spreads better than Delta. I think the reason Omicron is of interest, the reason why scientists are talking about it is because, you know, in general, each of the new variants comes from the one before it. So, you know, they are building on each other's mutations to um, there's like a level of positive selection and the virus is essentially evolving to become a better and better transmitter, not to become more pathogenic, just to become a better transmitter. And whatever follows with that, it's great. What's interesting about Omicron is Omicron does not come from our lineage of variants of concern. It comes from one of the early, early founders of the original Wuhan strain, which means that in order for it to have accumulated the whatever it is, 35 amino acid changes in spike protein, it would have required a very long time in an individual or in a population to accumulate that many mutations and then come out being able to compete in the world of, say, Delta transmission. And so it really strongly suggests that one of two things happened. Either it found a new host and it has been circulating in that new host for some time and then just happened to come back into the human population, which is a really scary thought because that would suggest that really this virus is going to be endemic and be with us forever. Um, but certainly possible, right? We know minks get it and we know hamsters get it for sure. So it's certainly possible that some rodent somewhere is also just naturally in the population now. Um, the other possibility um, is that it comes from somebody who was really immunocompromised for whatever reason. And that there are already really great reports about people who you know, were on a kidney transplant to go to a hospital, totally unrelated to SARS-CoV-2, but they contract the virus in the hospital. And unlike most people who clear all infectious virus within you know, five or six days, the individuals on heavy immunocompromised drugs where T cells and B cells are being knocked down can show chronic infections lasting, you know, six or seven months. And that also provides this playground for the virus to really explore evolutionary space and, and be able to do something like generate a 35 amino acid, you know, change in a protein that's still perfectly functional. Uh, and so I think Omicron is interesting from that standpoint. But I'm not overly worried that it's going to be the virus that escapes all vaccinations. Uh, clearly, if you are unvaccinated, you should be very concerned about Omicron, just like you should be concerned about Delta. And for that reason, if we were all vaccinated, this really wouldn't be a problem. It would still be endemic. It would still pass from person to person. But then we are back into the world of just a common cold that, you know, we don't need to be overly concerned about it. On that topic of immune memory, uh, can you tell us more about how T and B cells collaborate with neutralizing antibodies to fight new infections? For sure. Um, so the way our immune system works is there's, um, you know, it really starts at the level of individual cells. So the first couple of cells that get infected, um, they're likely to die, um, but they have a couple jobs. And I, I like to break it up into these two camps. So before they die, they're going to send out two major messages. One message is going to be to all the cells in the neighboring area, and that's a call to arms. And it's telling those cells, you know, fortify and get ready because the virus is coming. It might kill you too, but like just you know, bring up your defenses, you know, get your, get all of your armature up in front so that you are ready to fight when you see this virus. That's the first thing it does. And the second thing it does is it calls in for reinforcements because the defenses of individual cells, while, you know, evolutionarily are quite strong, overall, usually the viruses that we've heard of have ability to block many of those defenses. And so you need professional cells, which are your T cells and your B cells and your macrophages. And so as those cells come to the site of infection, hopefully at that site of infection, that call to arms has slowed the virus down quite a bit. Uh, and then in come these you know, professional cells. And so some of the early professional cells will grab dead and dying cells, some like macrophages and dendritic cells, that will process up all the little pieces and they'll present them to the surface. And that's where T cells and B cells can actually look at these pieces and say, did this come from me or is this foreign? Right, this whole idea of self, non-self. And so if it's foreign, in this particular case, it's almost certainly going to be you know, a component of SARS-CoV-2. And so what generally happens is, of course, 
you know, the, the receptors that are sampling this material are not perfectly well fit. And so there is a very sophisticated process where, you know, a, a B cell or a T cell with a decent fit will be selected for and will rapidly mutate and change to make hundreds of variations of something that was close in order for it to get better and better as far as its ability to engage this small component from the virus. And both T cells and B cells are doing this for different reasons. The B cells actually have an ability to secrete antibodies. So they become something called a plasma cell and they can release an antibody. So it's a protein now in the surface that can bind to a virus with really high affinity. And the simple binding of that virus does many things. One, it can like actually interrupt the ability of that virus to infect a new cell. So that's one way you're going to clear virus from the, from the body. The other thing it does is it activates a lot of things. So the antibody bound to its target on the other end of the antibody are also a lot of other communicating signals that allow the body to, um, to grab hold of it or destroy it in a number of different ways. And so that's like the B cell compartment. The T cell compartment is a little bit different um, in that it's not secreting antibodies. Instead, what it's looking for is cells that have those same presentations on their surface so that they can they can quickly figure out cells that are infected or where there's a problem in cells and they can come target them and kill them to slow the infection down. So the two work in concert very nicely because the B cells are going to neutralize things that are in circulation and the T cells are going to basically clear out all the infected garbage while the macrophages and the DCs gobble that all up and then present more and more material to the immune system. And after a while, your immune system will have memorized every component of the virus. That's great. That's what happens to most people between 25 and say 70. They're relatively asymptomatic. They get a little sick. Your immune system does all these things, or you just provide it, you know, an mRNA that encodes spike, and then all those things happen, but just to the spike protein. But then, of course, in comes the variant. So what ends up happening is, you know, your body has now memorized certain structures of say spike protein, and now spike changes. So now maybe some of the antibodies you made, or some of the T cell responses that you made the thing that they recognize has changed ever so subtly, but enough to now render it less effective or maybe totally ineffective. And so the immune system kind of has to go back to the drawing board and again, go through that affinity maturation process to again, find ways to take what they have and make it now more adapt to the variants. And so the reason why, even though Omicron or Delta has diverged away quite a bit from the original strain that our vaccines were designed against, the reason why the vaccines still present are still um, advantageous to you is that they still give your immune system a head start in trying to recognize this now, you know, somewhat foreign structures. And not all the structures have changed. There are still going to be some epitopes, we call them. So some pieces of that protein that are the same as the original. And those antibodies that you've made, of course, will still function. So it's a combination of these two things. And, um, you know, to get back to the original question that you asked, is one of the ways a scientist, if you want to know, you know, how how concerned should we be for Omicron, for example? One of the very simple things that people do is they take blood from people. And so you could take, you know, take you know, 10 individuals that have never been vaccinated, take 10 individuals that got you know, a vaccination, maybe the first shot, 10 people that got the second shot, 10 people that got a booster, right? And now you've got kind of the whole, and then you can pick and match different, different scenarios, different vaccines, and you take their serum. And so with, this is the, this is the like the richest solution that's in your blood. So you take away all the cells in your blood, you just take this, this yellowy serum, and it's going to be chock full of different antibodies, including some against SARS. And so what you do is you take virus in a lab and you mix that virus with your with these individual serum and you give it say an hour. Now if you have antibodies to that virus, they're going to bind to the virus and then you're going to throw that entire culture onto cells and you're going to simply ask, can those cells still infect or sorry, can those viruses still infect cells or did the antibodies neutralize it? Another way to do this would be to take the protein, the spike protein, and you coat it onto a plate, right? So, you know, uh, GenScript can make this protein for us and we can put it onto a plate and then you can add that serum directly to the plate and you can just dilute up the serum. And so with these two assays, you can figure out exactly what, what kind of level of antibodies you have to spike protein, how strongly they bind based on their dilution, and you can see how effective they are by how good they are at neutralizing antibodies or how neutralizing like purified virus in a very experimental setup. Now, the problem with that is that you can do that assay and this is where people get really worried. So you might do this with Delta or Omicron and find, oh my goodness, like the antibodies that were 
drastically neutralizing the, you know, the beta variant are now no longer working on the Delta variant. And usually when you see the sensationalist news, it's coming out of an assay like that. And it's not wrong. That is the data. The problem with that data, though, is that they're only really measuring half of the response, right? They're only measuring the B cell response because the T cell response is much more sophisticated. It needs infected cells and it works in a different context, but you can't simply study it in the same way. In fact, to study that, you have to go back into animal models and, and do the kind of things that we do with as we call adoptive transfer, where you move just T cells or move just B cells into a naive mice and then challenge those mice so that you can measure the actual T cell compartment. And, you know, uh, one of the studies that we published in um, Science Immunology did exactly this, where we infected with the original Washington strain. Uh, then we did an adoptive transfer of T cells or B cells or both, put them into naive hamsters and then infected the naive, naive hamsters with a variant of concern. At the time it was the beta variant, but the experiment would hold true regardless if it was Delta or Omicron. And what you find is that while B cells definitely do play a major role in the defenses, T cells play an equally strong role in those defenses. So you can get just as much protection from your T cell response as you can from your B cell response. And so that's, that is really good news because it means that some of the sensationalist claims or worries that come out of people who do this test on serum, you know, shouldn't be taken as biblical because there is a whole other half of the story that can come to our rescue. Well, thank you for explaining that for us and breaking down how um, each individual cell's roles uh, can help prevent the reinfection and how TMB cells are equally important uh, than they are let out to be. Uh, so can you tell us more about how your lab is using CRISPR-Cas systems to develop virus therapeutics? Oh, absolutely. So. Um... So CRISPR-Cas system, so for, for anybody in the audience who maybe is not entirely aware of it, it's, it's actually a bacterial antiviral defense system or a, a archaea antiviral defense system that has recently been repurposed to allow for gene editing. And there are many different types of Cas9. You really should view it as like the, the Cas proteins are basically a pair of scissors with no specificity. And so what you do is you provide a little piece of RNA that, you know, binds to the pair of scissors and provides the specificity, you know, extreme specificity at that. And there are scissors that cut DNA and there are scissors that cut RNA. And so, you know, in a perfect world, if you wanted to, you could take something like uh, an RNA version of those scissors, like a Cas13, and put it, uh, a guide RNA on it that's going to recognize SARS-CoV-2. And you would have a beautiful, very specific antiviral system where, you know, you, you're, you're going to deliver a pair of RNA scissors that everywhere it sees SARS-CoV-2 is going to cut it up, neutralize the infection altogether. Um, in theory, that would work 100% of the time, and you could use that to cure yourself of any virus you wanted to. You could also cure a lot of diseases using the DNA pair of scissors. Um, the problem um, falls on delivery, and you know, delivery is, is a huge issue in, in biology and translating the findings from a basic biology standpoint into something translational that can be used in a hospital. Um, and so delivering the, this, this, these CAS members, are, they're very, very large proteins. It is not a trivial thing to deliver them. And in fact, you know, um, often you, you have to require the use of basically a gutted virus that's entirely retooled to now deliver a payload of, say, guide and CAS. And even then, you need to have such a high efficiency if you wanted to fight off something like SARS-CoV-2. You would really need that delivery to be incredibly efficient so that you could get into all the cells that SARS-CoV-2 is infecting. That really, we're not there yet. Um, there are definitely lots of people working on it, but we're really not there yet. Um, the other way though, you can use CRISPR-Cas systems for you know, antivirals is, is something that we did. We published a paper in Cell, uh, I wanna say March of last year, uh, where we did uh, a CRISPR screen on um, SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. And you can, this is a, quite a standard system where and we're using a DNA pair of scissors now and we're actually targeting the human genome. And the question is, if you take you know, every gene expressed in the human genome and you target each one individually and then you infect with the virus, you can select for the cells that are now no longer infectable um, because you've deleted some essential host factor that the virus needs. And so an assay like that can quickly identify you know, 50 to 100 transcripts that are absolutely critical for the biology of this virus to survive and replicate. And if those products are druggable or have, you know, best case scenario, have an FDA approved drug that is known to target a member of that pathway or maybe even that exact protein, 
then you, it will inform you as to things that might be very valuable antivirals in the SARS-CoV-2 space. And so I, I would argue that that's probably the most um, streamlined utilization of CRISPR-Cas in being antiviral at this point until we solve the delivery problem. Well, Dr. Tenno, over, thank you so much for meeting with me today to uh, discuss more about immune memory uh, conferred from SARS-CoV-2 and future variant protection, as well as the future of viral therapeutics. My pleasure. Anytime.